Point of order. We turn now to the budget. It's the debate on motion 10518 in the name of Derek Mackay on stage three of the budget. Now, as members will be aware, at this stage in the proceedings, uh, I'm required to give a determination as to whether or not any provision in this bill relates to protected subject matter. In other words, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the budget relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. We turn now to the budget, and I call on the Finance Secretary, Cabinet Secretary, Derek Mackay, to speak to and move the motion in his name. Well, can I say, Presiding Officer, that's a great relief to me uh, and I'm sure the rest of the Chamber. And I'm delighted to lead this debate on the Budget Bill for 2018-19. And firstly, I'd like to confirm that I've responded formally to the Finance Committee report on the Budget. And I'd like to thank the Finance Committee and the Subject Committees for their constructive approach, particularly in light of the scrutiny period. And I look forward to continuing work with the Parliament to ensure that our future processes are indeed fit for our new powers. This is a bill of huge importance to Scotland and the decisions we make today will support our commitment to inclusive growth and provide support to our public services, to those who deliver those services and to the communities and individuals across Scotland. The bill before us today seeks Parliament's approval for over £1.2 billion of additional expenditure to build a fairer, more prosperous country and put the progressive values of this government into action. It is a bill which reflects our status as a Parliament of minorities, a Parliament... Yes, I will. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Does the Cabinet Secretary think it's progressive that MSPs, as a result of this budget, will only pay an additional 29 pence a week in tax? Cabinet Secretary. Well, James Kelly is just simply wrong. And what the budget proposes to do is to raise taxation in a fair and proportionate way which will deliver hundreds of millions of pounds more for the public services of Scotland. And in the next financial year, the tax decisions that we've taken over the last two years uh, and the adjustments that have been made post block grant adjustment amount to over 400 million pounds additional resources for Scotland's public services. Surely the Labour Party at this 11th hour can welcome that investment in Scotland's public services. But this, this is a bill in which, this is a bill in which of course I've had to reach out to find consensus uh, in the Parliament and to be able to compromise uh, as well. Uh, this is necessary to reach the agreement on the package of measures that will boost the economy and support our public services. And we've worked very hard to secure the passage of this bill in order to deliver on our commitments that protect Scotland's much valued social contract. And I once again thank those who have engaged constructively in those discussions. Presiding officer, the most successful economies in Europe are built upon the firm foundation of strong public services and inclusive societies. Equally, those foundations require a strong economy to generate the necessary resources to fund them. The Scot I will. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. On the basis of, of requiring those strong foundations, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why 28,000 jobs have been taken out of local government in the last few years under his government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the scaremongering of the Labour Party as it relates to local government continues in that what this budget, what this budget proposes to do is to give a real terms increase to local government in the next financial year and they will also have the ability to raise the council tax. And you see, the difficulty for the Labour Party is, tonight in voting with the Tories, I suspect, they will vote against that extra money to local government and vote against that extra £1.2 billion to Scotland's public services. That's the reality of what the Labour Party will do this evening. The Scottish, I'd like to make some more progress. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has highlighted some economic challenges around Brexit uncertainty and the declining working age population. 
However, it is important to recognise that Scotland's economic performance has remained resilient. It is encouraging that the latest Bank of Scotland PMI reported that business optimism in Scotland is at a three-year high, but we will not be complacent and we will build on those strong fundamentals through the measures in this bill to stimulate economic activity and improve productivity. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, very, thank you very much. The Finance Secretary talks about the resilience of the Scottish economy. Does he agree with the analysis of the Fraser Valander that the Scotland, Scotland's economy is facing the longest period of weak economic growth for 60 years? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, the Tories really cannot abdicate their responsibility for macroeconomic policy in Scotland. But... But what this government will do in supporting this budget will invest almost £2.4 billion in enterprise and skills through higher and further education and our enterprise agencies. We'll give a 64% increase in the economy, jobs and fair work portfolio. We'll allocate £18 million for the new National Manufacturing Institute and £10 million for the new South of Scotland Development Agency. And we will double to £122 million in funding allocated to the city region deals. This government is investing in economic growth in the teeth of Tory cuts and Tory opposition. On business rates, we will offer the most attractive package of non-domestic rates release anywhere in the UK, amounting to now over £720 million. And of course, the UK's first nursery relief to support our childcare policies. Our growth accelerator will encourage business to invest in their premises, to drive improvements in productivity, and we have delivered on the business community's number one ask, which was to cap an annual uplift in business rates at CPI rather than RPI. Today's bill invests £1.2 billion in our transport system, turning the A9 into an electric highway and delivering new railway investments such as the electric trains between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Willie Rennie. About the state of the Scottish economy, will he comment on the rise in unemployment today by 14,000 people? Will he comment on that? Is he complacent about that? Cabinet Secretary. It is lower than it was last year. And all the more reason to support this budget to invest in the economy, in skills, in productivity, in R&D, in innovation, and all those areas. Presiding officer, I can confirm that Transport Scotland has now developed specific proposals on how the pre-pipeline fund for new rail projects will work and be governed, and will publish full details over the coming weeks. As I confirmed at stage one, uh, between 2017-18 and 18-19, the proportion of the Scottish Government capital budget spent on low carbon has increased from 21 to 29 per cent, and the proportion of our capital budget that is spent on low carbon projects will continue to increase in future years. To further support our transition to a low carbon economy, this budget invests £146 million in energy efficiency and heat decarbonisation, including real terms protection for the Home Energy Efficiency Programme. It also allocates £60 million for a low carbon innovation fund, £20 million to support the transition to electric vehicles and support more green buses and doubles investment in active and sustainable travel. The budget today delivers £756 million of investment in affordable housing and £10 million towards an ending homelessness together fund as part of our commitment to eradicate rough sleeping and to transform the use of temporary accommodation. These investments will help ensure that our future growth will be both inclusive and sustainable. Investment now in infrastructure and support for business needs to be complemented by investment in our people and our services and our communities. Education is this government's number one priority and this is backed by above inflation investment in our universities, colleges and local government. £243 million to support the expansion of publicly funded early learning and childcare entitlement, £120 million allocated directly to head teachers through the Pupil Equity Fund, and a further £59 million to provide targeted support to children and young people in the greatest need. And we're also providing the first investment of a new £50 million tackling child poverty fund, which will help to address the underlying social and economic causes of poverty. And yesterday, 
I laid the local government finance order, which includes the additional £170 million announced following the constructive discussions with the Scottish Green Party at stage one. And this delivers an above inflation investment in local government for local revenue services and adds to the real terms increase in capital support. This has been welcomed by COSLA and I note that so far 11 councils have exercised the flexibility that they have to increase their council tax levels by up to 3% and if the remaining councils follow suit this will be worth around a further £77 million to support local services next year. I also had the opportunity yesterday to see a prime example of support for our NHS when I went to leaf surgery. I saw at first hand how the additional funding provided by the budget delivers for our core public services. This bill will see an extra £400 million increase in health resource funding and take our total frontline investment in the NHS to more than £13 billion. We will invest £110 million in reform of primary care, supporting our general practitioners and health centres to meet the changing needs of our people. And we'll increase our direct investment in mental health services, child and adolescent mental health services in particular, by a further £17 million. That is the third annual increase in a row, which will help to deliver an additional 800 mental health workers over the session of Parliament. Okay. Jenny Mara. Thank the Cabinet Secretary give way. If he is committed to improving children's health, is he minded to drop the regressive sports tax from his budget today? His cash grab that condemns communities to crumbling sports facilities for generations to come. Cabinet Secretary. I, I certainly won't follow Labour's chaotic and damaging tax plans, which would result in less resource uh, than they have claimed. In terms of non-domestic rates, I have not followed the Barclay recommendations and I have supported the project in Dundee. Surely Jenny Mara would have welcomed that in terms of my uh, decision. So in supporting the NHS, this government also continues to support free personal care and the rollout of Frank's Law by April 2019. Presiding officer, this budget is about investing in a fairer Scotland. Yes, there is divergence from the UK. Our investments mean students don't pay tuition fees. Those who are ill don't pay prescription charges. Our citizens aren't vulnerable to the bedroom tax. And I'm proud to represent the only government in the UK to lift the public sector pay cap and offer a real pay rise to public sector staff. <laughs> we'll offer the most attractive system of business rates uh, we will invest in social rented housing, uh, delivering at more than double the rate uh, in England, and will provide above inflation investment in local government, police and the NHS. That's the best deal anywhere in the UK, and that's why a recent YouGov poll showed that the Scottish public support our proportionate approach. So, presiding officer, when it comes to decision time, I would invite members of parliament to support a budget which sees Scotland not only being the fairest tax part of the UK, but for a majority of taxpayers, the lowest tax part of the UK, a budget which reverses the real terms cut that Westminster has opposed, imposed on our resource budget and delivers £1.2 billion of additional investment in public services and the economy. A budget that protects our students, a budget that protects our elderly in need of care, a budget that protects council services, a budget that protects our police services and invests in the National Health Service. Presiding officer, this budget delivers the best deal for taxpayers in the whole of the UK. It's a budget that protects all that we hold dear whilst investing in our nation's future and that makes the use of the powers of this parliament to put progressive values of this government into action. And I commend it to the chamber. Thank you. I would urge all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Murdo Fraser to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, another day, another budget debate. Sadly, the narrative from the SNP government remains exactly uh, what it was yesterday uh, and for weeks before. This is a pay more, get less budget. A budget prepared against a backdrop of the UK block grant to Scotland increasing from this year to the next, a fact confirmed by Spice, 
confirmed by the Fraser of Allender Institute, and a fact that has been accepted by the Finance Secretary himself. And as we heard again uh, yesterday, it is a budget which breaks a promise that the SNP made in their manifesto in 2016 not to increase the basic rate of income tax, as a consequence of which over one million Scots will be paying more tax than equivalent workers south of the border, sending out a message that Scotland is the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. And while taxes are going up, presiding officer, services are being cut, because across Scotland this week, local authorities are meeting to set their budgets. And the warnings from COSLA are clear, that despite the additional money that has been found by the Scottish Government as a result of their deal with the Greens, councils are still having to make savings. Whether it is reducing the number of teachers, cutting classroom assistance, scrapping school crossing patrollers, closing recycling centres or libraries, all across the countries, people's experience is that they are actually getting poorer quality public services while at the same time they are being asked to pay more in taxation. Now this budget does deliver pay increases for public sector workers. Those employed by the Scottish Government and its agencies uh, and in the NHS will all benefit. But there is nothing in this budget to deliver higher salaries for local authority workers, who no doubt will have a similar expectation to those elsewhere in the public sector. And yet, if those sort of pay settlements are to be made, they can only be made by local authorities cutting services elsewhere. Even a local authority maximising its council tax increase at 3% will not raise enough money to pay the level of increases to staff that are being applied elsewhere in the public sector. This is a point, presiding officer, made by Councillor Gail McGregor, COSLA's resources spokesman. I know that uh, the Finance Secretary knows Councillor McGregor. He was all over Twitter last night, uh, pictured cavorting with Councillor McGregor at a, a glitzy Scotland Excel event. But what she said on Tuesday, and I'm sure she would have repeated this to him when they were together last night, she said this, because quite simply, with no money in the settlement from Scottish Government for pay, any pay rises for council workers can only come from cuts to services or council tax rises. So I'd be interested to hear from SNP speakers in this debate. As to if, if Mr Fitzpatrick likes to intervene on me, I'm very happy to give way. He will just heckle from his sedentary position. Oh, please, come on. Joe come Fitzpatrick. On. So the Tories' tax plans would, would take £500 million out of the budget, plus you want to find extra money for local government. What are you going to cut? Bernie Fraser. The figure, Mr. Fraser, needs to keep it in his head. £16.5 billion. Pounds. That is the cost of SNP failure to the Scottish economy. That is our failure for not growing our economy for the last 15 years at the same rate as the UK. If you grew the economy, you'd have more money to spend, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, presiding officer, seems to be able to find money when he needs to. Because in order to do his deal uh, with the Greens, to provide Patrick's pocket money, he found an extra £110 million from underspend and reserves. Of that, £40 million is coming from reserves and £70 million from underspend. Now, this is curious, presiding officer, because when the Finance Secretary came to the Finance and Constitution Committee on the 15th of January, I quizzed him about how much money was available in the budget in this area. The figure in the draft budget for budget exchange and reserve was stated at £158 million. Pounds. The Cabinet Secretary said in response to me, and I quote, in the past, finance secretaries may have been able to hold on to that money for financial management reasons. For example, I have used the money up front for the purposes of budget negotiations. The figure is what it is because there is very tight financial management, and that is the figure that the officials think is most appropriate. And yet, presiding officer, when the budget bill was presented to Parliament on the 31st of January, 12 working days later, that figure of £158 million had gone up by £110 million, a 70% increase in 12 working days. And it's perfectly clear, the Cabinet Secretary had that money squirrelled away to do his deal with the Greens, but he wasn't telling Parliament and wasn't telling its committees about it. And there is a, a serious point here, presiding officer, about our ability as a parliament to conduct budget scrutiny. Because in a period of 12 working days, from giving evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee to presenting his budget bill, 
an additional £110 million was found. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that this is money the Cabinet Secretary knew perfectly well about when he came to the Finance and Constitution Committee. As had members of that committee, or indeed other subject committees of this Parliament, conducting budget scrutiny, been made aware of these additional resources, much more meaningful discussions could have taken place about how the budget might have been improved. But the Finance Secretary chose not to disclose this. So, Presiding Officer, there is a serious point here. I think we need a new approach in future. We need to be much clearer as a Parliament and as committees of this Parliament exactly how much money is in the budget. And as we look at recommending the implementation of the Budget Review Group, I hope this is a question that can be addressed. But, Presiding Officer, to return to the key messages in this budget, what this budget does not do is address the woeful situation that we now have in the Scottish economy. Today we learnt that Scottish employment is now lower than the UK average. Economic activity in Scotland is higher than the UK average and unemployment is higher than the UK average. The Scottish Fiscal Commission have told us their prediction that the SNP-run economy in Scotland will fail to match UK growth in each of the next five years. In 2018, it will grow at half the rate of the UK as a whole and is projected to have the lowest growth of any major economy in the next three years. The lowest in the EU, the lowest in the G20, and the lowest in the OECD. If I have time, I'll give way to Mr Mason. Yeah. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that the London and South East economy is somewhat different from the rest of the UK, and in fact Scotland is very comparable with other English regions? Murdy Fraser. Oh, well, that's not what the Fiscal Commission have been telling us, uh, presiding officer. That's not what they, their figures would disclose. Indeed, if you look at the productivity figures for Scotland, they would suggest that Scotland is among the poorest performing parts of the United Kingdom. But Mr Mason, like too many SNP backbenchers, wants to absolve the Scottish Government of any responsibility for the performance of the Scottish economy. They need to start taking responsibility for what's actually happening in Scotland. <laughs> presiding officer, this is a budget we should have put growing the economy first. It should have been a budget for growth. Instead, it is a budget for cuts in public services and higher taxes. As Sir Tom Hunter, one of Scotland's leading business figures, put it, the perception if you are a talented person sitting in London, Manchester or Birmingham and Scotland wants to attract you is that you may think Scotland is a high tax economy. We should be listening to voices like Tom Hunter, listening to voices like Liz Cameron of the Chambers of Commerce, listening to the CBI, to the Federation of Small Business, to Scottish Engineering, to the Scottish Retail Consortium, all of those have warned about the potential damage that will be done from having higher income tax rates. Presiding officer, I'm no fan of his politics or of his music, but even Morrissey got it right when he said, <laughs> when he said of the First Minister, those hands will be in anybody's pockets. <laughs> Presiding officer, the SNP government have chosen to ignore all these voices and have delivered us a budget that's bad for Scotland. That's why we should vote against it at decision time tonight. I call on James Kelly to open for the Labour Party. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a budget for chief executives in Morningside, not for communities facing savage SNP cuts. It's a budget that fails the needs of Scotland's communities. Parents in Clack Manninshire will be dismayed to see a budget resulting in cuts to teachers in their schools. Parents of children living in poverty, struggling to pay energy bills, won't understand why MSPs see their tax bills barely increasing. Pensioners phoning their GPs today, unable to get appointments till next week, won't understand why SNP MSPs are cheering for Derek Mackay's budget. This budget fails on so many levels and should be voted down by Parliament tonight. Because if you look at one of the key areas of investment that are required support for public services, the reality is that even after the changes announced following the grubby deal between Derek Mackay and the Greens, there still remains a £386 million black hole in local government, local government funding. 
And it's not just the numbers, it's the decisions that local councils are having to face. If you look at Murray Council looking to have to reduce library assistance and close library services, and Clark Manningshire, the reduction of teaching posts and learning assistance, what does that do to help educate our children? What, what does that do to help build the skills in the economy? And in South Lanarkshire Council, we see in proposed increased charges for school, school meals and increased charges for care services. All of that at a time when the, the Cabinet Secretary announces a pay policy but doesn't provide adequate funding Absolutely. to fully fund that policy. At the start of this process, there was a £200 million shortfall in the, the, the amount of money required in order to fund the, the, the pay policy. And as we've gone through, no new money uh, comes through. And the reality for that, particularly for local councils, is that they, they face a decision as to, if they really want to fund uh, fair pay, then they need to cut services. And they potentially, as we see in Clark Manisha, need to, to cut jobs as well in order to fund that pay. There is also the, the reality of the modern scandal of child poverty in Scotland. 260,000 children living in poverty. Uh, recently there was a question at Finance Questions in relation to Ayrshire and it came up that in Irvine West alone, 36% of children are living in poverty. That's totally unacceptable. Yet the, the SNP have rejected the proposals from Labour to increase child benefit and to alleviate the child poverty in, in wards like Irvine West and throughout the country. And yesterday, we saw again in the NHS figures the, the drastic A&E performance figures as the NHS uh, continues to struggle through this winter. So in so many aspects, uh, this, this budget has failed and is not fit for purpose. And part of the reason for that is also the debate that we had yesterday afternoon uh, on tax. Because ultimately, if you want to provide a budget that addresses all these issues across public services and funds pay fair pay and tackles child poverty, then you need a tax regime that raises adequate amounts of money. I'll give way to Kate Forbes. Kate Forbes. Eastern raising revenue from various different sources, including a tourist tax and a land value tax. How much would either of these raise next year? James Kelly. Uh, they would raise £145 million in total, <laughs> as we detailed, as we detailed, as we detailed in our tax plan. The reality, the reality is. The reality is that those on those benches do not, do not have the political will to make the changes required. There are, communities, there are communities across this country facing savage cuts, saving the closure of f facilities, facing the prospect of job losses, and yet the meagre tax plans brought forward by Derek Mackay only raise a net £83 million. And, that's, and that shows the poverty of ambition Absolutely. from Absolutely. Cabinet Secretary Mackay and his colleagues. <laughs> Look at the facts. SNP MSPs will only be paying 29 pence more tax a week. Chief executives on £150,000 will only pay £17 more a week. It's a complete failure to take on the gravity of the issues Absolutely. that we face. Absolutely. Time and time again, when it comes to an election campaign, the SNP posture and declare that they support a 50p top rate of tax. But when it comes to delivering in this chamber, when it comes to putting when your money where your mouth is, eight times you've voted against a 50p top rate of tax. You run away from taking the decisions that are required to meet the challenges that, that are faced in Scotland's communities. The reality is, the reality is that we need bold and radical action in order to address 
the, 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 the issues that we face in the country. I mean, if we really want to, if we really want to grow the economy, you don't grow the economy by cutting public services. You don't grow the economy by taking teachers uh, and teaching posts out of schools. You don't grow the economy uh, by undermining, no, no, thank you, by undermining college budgets. You need to make that investment if you're going to see kids, you know, graduate in the STEM subjects and make that contribution to the skilled economy. You don't, you fail to make the, the joined up thinking that's required. And the same is true in relation to child benefit, because it's not just about trying to lift kids out of poverty. That would, that would help in terms of improving the education system if there are less children in poverty. It would help in terms of the housing budgets and also the NHS. So it would save money across the, the, the Scottish budgets. The reality is we've had a number of debates on this now and it's like Groundhog Day. The government's answers, the government's answers are they continue to be weak on tax powers and people will suffer. This is a budget that's more interesting in protecting the pockets of chief executives rather than putting <laughs> teachers in schools. This is a budget that fails to address the scandal of child poverty and the cuts to public services. This is a budget that lets Scotland down and this is a budget that should be rejected by this parliament tonight. Colin Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Reddy. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Well, uh, I think uh, Murdo Fraser said another day, another budget debate. Certainly another day, another opportunity for the Conservative Party uh, to conveniently forget that during the first minority government session, they voted through budget after budget after budget. Every single year, in fact, the Conservative Party voted for the SNP's budget. They did that, they did that by going in and negotiating and trying to get policy changes. Now, they never quite managed a policy change during those years on anything like the scale that the Greens have achieved over the last two years. And I have to admit, and I have to admit that I'm glad that they've decided to stop negotiating properly. We might well be seeing much worse budgets if the Conservative Party were still negotiating and trying to get policy change out of the Scottish Government as they used to. But I do say, I do say I remain disappointed that progressive political parties across this chamber are not also attempting to get change in the Scottish budget. It may, wire, it may well reduce my negotiating hand if other parties engaged constructively in that process, but I suspect the outcome would be better as a whole. And for, and for those who did bring forward proposals at the very last minute, too late even for the Fiscal Commission to examine them, uh, I really think that the process needs to be better in future. What we've got as a result of the negotiating process that we engaged in with the Scottish Government is significant change. Not only uh, those smaller scale measures, the uh, additional fund which the Finance Secretary mentioned for communities to bring forward their own proposals on rail improvements, which I'm glad to see will be happening sooner than I expected. Not only the extra money to accelerate marine protected areas to protect our, our marine environment, not only a long-term shift away from high carbon investment to low carbon uh, investment uh, and an improvement in the public sector pay settlement, but also that substantial reversal in the cuts to local government. Now, is the situation for local government perfect? Of course not. Does this budget relieve local government of every pressure that it faces? Of course not. But this is a real terms increase in the funding coming from the Scottish government to local government, and that is an important step forward. I see, I see Monica Lennon is looking to intervene. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Patrick Harvey. I wonder if he agrees with Mike Kirby uh, from Unison, who says that the budget falls far short of maintaining vital levels of services for our local authorities. Does he agree? Patrick Harvey. I certainly agree that local government faces significant pressures. Some of that relates to rising costs. Some of that relates to our expectation for a fair pay settlement. But what that cannot be placed at is cuts to the core funding from the Scottish Government 
local government uh, finance order. We have ensured that that is going up, not down. Now, the longer term picture, the longer term picture, presiding officer, is one where I think we need to unite. Whatever we disagree with about this budget, we need to unite on saying that the annual Scottish budget process must not become an annual rearguard action against local government cuts. Because the fundamental situation that local government remains in is one of utter dependence on Scottish government revenue. They have so limited financial power that I think in many other European countries, what we have that we call local government in Scotland would not be recognised as such. Local government ought to have a far greater ability to make its own decisions around local taxation and other fiscal issues. These are issues that I think there should be agreement across political parties on. I welcome some of Labour's proposals on what they've called, but isn't a land value tax, a levy on vacant and derelict land. I'd like to see that and a real land value tax, but we know it would take time to legislate for these and to implement them. I want to see progress on that. I also want to see progress on the recommendations that were agreed across political parties by the Commission on Local Tax Reform, which the Scottish Government and COSLA created, and which recommended centrally the current system of council tax must end. Now, the recommendations from that review, which all of us entered into, with the exception of the Conservatives, all of us who took part entered into that process on good faith, as did local government indeed as well. Those recommendations cannot be allowed to gather dust uh, on the shelf. So today, I've written to the First Minister an open letter setting out a range of proposals that must be taken forward if we're going to ensure that we're not in this situation year after year after year where Scottish budgets become debates about how much pressure to push down the chain to local government. We should be setting a target for the percentage of local council finance which is raised locally. We should be introducing a new fiscal framework between the Scottish Government and local government underpinned by the incorporation of the European Charter for local self-government into domestic law. We should be ensuring a commitment to multi-year, indicative at least, funding settlements from the Scottish Government and baselining the additional funds which have been won this year so that they can be relied upon for the future. We should be committing to legislation during the current parliamentary session to replace council tax uh, with a fairer system. And again, this will take time for consultation, legislation and implementation, but the initial steps must begin if we're going to make progress. And on non-domestic rates, what we were promised by the Scottish Government was a fundamental review and reform of the non-domestic rates. And what we got instead was an incredibly limited and narrow review, the Barclay Review, and so that wider question remains as well as vacant and derelict land levy, new fiscal powers need to be created for local government in order that we can have local government that is truly worthy of the name in Scotland, where they are not so entirely dependent on centralised decisions being made by the Scottish Government. If there is progress on this local tax reform agenda over the coming months and during the course of this year, then the Greens will again be able to enter budget negotiations. But that, I'm afraid, will be a precondition. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. This budget is built on a broken promise. Nicola Sturgeon, who's on the front bench today, will remember she stood beside me in those debates in the 2016 election, and she promised basic rate taxpayers that their tax would not go, go up. And now what we see in this budget is that it's gone up. And the, the reason why this is important is because they led people to believe that their tax would not go up. And that's important in terms of the integrity of a government and its belief in terms of how it conducts itself in terms of tax. If people are expected to pay more tax, they should be told that before an election campaign, just like the Liberal Democrats did. We were very clear, we were open, we were upfront about it. And the SNP were not upfront about that, and that breaks trust with the voters. That is incredibly important. Yes, John Mason. John Mason. I wonder if the member could confirm that he believes in proportional representation and that one minority party should not be able to force through its manifesto. 
Willie Rennie. The argument was being made before, and he dismissed that very argument when we were in coalition. But now he wants to resurrect that argument to, to patch up their pathetic campaign to try and justify this tax rise. I think it's important that people are honest, open, and upfront before election campaigns. But the SNP has not been that. We believe that tax rises should be for a specific purpose to make sure you invest to make a change so people see the outcome at the end of that process. That builds confidence in any tax rises and progressives like me believe that it's important that we do make that case. Now, the economy we've seen today with the, the job figures that have been announced that shows that unemployment in Scotland has gone up 14,000 should be a warning signal for the Scottish Government. Now, to be fair, the UK figure has gone up as well, but even then, the Scottish figure is above the UK average. So we should be having a budget today that really reflects that and meets the big challenge because we have a second challenge coming down the track, which I'm sure the Minister will agree with me is, is a big threat, which is on Brexit. And the one thing that the Scottish Government and the UK Government agree on is that the predictions on all models put forward show that there will be a hit to the Scottish and the UK economy of between 2% and 9% as a result of Brexit. Whatever model you choose, there's going to be a hit. We should have a budget that matches that, that lives up to the potential and the challenge that is forthcoming, a budget for the long term that is bold and meets those challenges. But yet again, this budget is a missed opportunity. The SNP are often behind the curve on the big issues that are put forward, on issues like the pupil premium, it took five whole years before the Scottish Government admitted that the plan by the UK Government to implement that was working. It was closing the attainment gap by five percentage points. It took five years, though, for them to admit that it was working. So we're five years behind the curve, and that's a missed generation. On colleges, the colleges were starved of funds for a good five years. 150,000 places were cut from the colleges, thanks to the SNP. Now they finally admitted that that policy was wrong and they're now opening the doors for part-time, mature students and women to take up the opportunities that are there for them, behind the curve, for a good five years. Then on nursery education. I repeatedly, I was boring everybody in the parliament, I'm sure, at the time. <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> when I was going on, yeah, they agree. Yeah, they agree. I tell you, I went on and on about nursery education because it really mattered. And it took years, years for the SNP to accept that there was a case for two-year-olds to get nursery education. Now they've got it. Two-year-olds are skipping through the doors of those nursery schools thanks to the advocacy that we put forward. But yet again, the SNP were behind the curve. And finally, on mental health, the worst of all, the, the strategy was delayed for over a year, thanks to the SNP. The suicide prevention strategy was delayed. And as a result, the investment was delayed in mental health, no. So th there's another missed opportunity here to really get people who are suffering from mental health problems back into the job market, giving them the opportunities that everyone else enjoys in society. Again, the SNP behind the curve. Behind, no, not just now. I've made it clear that what I think this government should be is a bold government that's meeting the challenges on Brexit and is not missing these opportunities so it's not behind the curve. Now, there is one, one bright spot within the budget, and that is the advocacy of my colleagues Liam MacArthur and Tavish Scott on the ferries. They saved, they saved the internal ferry services for the Northern Isles from collapse. They saved it. If it wasn't for them, the lifeline services would be struggling. And it is the SNP government, it, no, the SNP government that would have overseen the collapse of those services. That is the one bright spot. And I commend the advocacy of my colleagues Liam MacArthur and Tavish Scott. But what this government should be doing is investing for transformational change. Transformational change on mental health to take the budget up to £1.2 billion, pounds, where it should be to tackle the problems. That's where the budget should be. The budget should be investing £500 million pounds in education, in nurseries, in schools and in colleges, not just for the sake of education, 
but for the sake of our economy as well, because by investing in the skills and talents of our people, we can grow that economy for, for the future. We can grow the economy in the face of the challenge of Brexit being pursued by the Conservatives. And we can meet that challenge that we see today with 14,000 more people unemployed under this government. Those are the things that we should be doing. This is the opportunity that this government is missing. Thank you. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this Stage 3 Budget Bill debate this afternoon. I'm pleased because I sincerely believe that this is perhaps the, the most important budget setting day since the advent of devolution now almost 19 years ago. And I'm very pleased that this SNP government has submitted to Parliament a budget which sets the tone for the type of nation we want to be and clearly outlines the values of the progressive politicians who back it. So too does this budget have the potential to be transformative in the improvements it can deliver for the citizens of Scotland. This is a budget which at its heart and within the limited powers available to this Parliament will deliver a stronger economy and a fairer Scotland. And you know, if there is one spending commitment that signals how we can build that stronger economy and fairer country to begin to transform Scotland, it is the investment of £600 million to deliver superfast broadband to 100% of properties. Here we have a commitment that says loudly and clearly to all of Scotland, nowhere, no matter where you live, whether it's in one of our great cities or in the remotest part of our fantastic land, no part of our country will be left behind. And here's a commitment matched nowhere else on these islands that clearly sets the tone for the type of nation to be we want to be. A nation that will give you the potential to succeed in the coming digital age, no matter where you choose to make your home or to live and work. As technology advances, so too must our country. Geography can no longer be a barrier to you being connected to the digital world and all the advantages that can bring, both economically and socially. In contrast, the UK government are doing their level best to create new barriers to economic success through the madness of a possible hard Brexit and the inevitable impact this will have, particularly on the availability of labour. In, in Scotland, therefore, we must do all we can to enable as many people as possible to enter the workforce of the future. And that's not just an objective that's of economic necessity, it's also about building a more resilient, fairer and more equal society. Again, setting out the type of nation and country we want to be. And that's why the funding of early learning and childcare through both capital and revenue spending of £243 million in next financial year alone is so necessary to support the infrastructure and workforce capacity. This funding will help drive transformational change in the availability of early learning and childcare, doubling funded provision from 600 to 1,140 hours by 2020. And you know, I don't think it's possible to overemphasise just how important high quality learning and childcare can be to ensure our children and their parents are in a position to achieve their full potential. And every child in Scotland deserves the best start in life, regardless of their background, and the expansion of free early learning and childcare can help just do, do just that. Now, as well as transforming the choices and chances of children, this policy will also save families thousands of pounds in fees every year and a further benefit to the wider economy through the creations of thousands of new jobs. This is a budget that, despite the backdrop of a UK government cut in our day-to-day -day spending, Murdo MacLeod, oh, Murdo MacLeod? Murdo Fraser. <laughs> Bring back Murdo MacLeod. He was at, much better at playing the ball than Murdo Fraser ever was. <laughs> Spending of £211 million commits increased funding of £400 million to Scotland's NHS. And over the course of the next five years, this is a budget that will see investment in mental health services increased by £17 million, delivering an additional 800 mental health workers. From the doubling of active travel budget to additional £15 million investment in research and development, from real terms increase in both college and higher education budget to an additional £170 million for local government. This is a budget that delivers for all of Scotland. Of course, 
To be in a position to support such a budget, you require revenue-raising proposals that are sensitive to the needs of individuals and organisations, and also, crucially, are capable of gathering support across a wide spectrum of stakeholders and society. And you know, like most people in here, I aspire to live in a prosperous, progressive, fair Scotland. That's why I am so very proud to be supporting a government whose tax proposals also set the tone for the type of nation we want to be. Tax proposals that protect those on the lowest incomes and make the system much more progressive. Now, those who are opposed to the government's budget will need to look to themselves as to why they cannot support plans that I have no doubt undoubtedly will make Scotland the fairest tax part of the United Kingdom while protecting our country against the worst excesses of the Tory government, invest investing our National Health Service, protecting our services and growing our economy. President Officer, in conclusion, I am sure of, very sure of one thing today. Those who support this budget in our Parliament here in Edinburgh today will be in tune with the values of the vast majority of the people of Scotland. Yeah. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Kate Forbes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. During the budget debates, we have heard time and again the SNP's standard line on the economy, that the fundamentals of the Scottish economy are strong. However, once you look beyond this SNP spin, you see the reality. Because recent data published by the Scottish Government itself has highlighted the unprecedented weakness faced by the economy. Economic growth in Scotland is now the lowest in the developed world. We have seen the value of Scottish trade decline 5%. Business investment is down 15%, and just last week, productivity figures show that productivity in Scotland is at the lowest levels for a decade. Yes, I will. Keith Brown. Can I thank uh, Dean Lockett for taking the intervention, just specifically in relation to business investment. He will know the relationship between capital allowances and investment in businesses, something controlled by the UK government. Could he characterise whether the, he thinks there's any involvement by the UK government in the economy in Scotland, unlike his colleague Murdo Fraser? Dean Lockhart. Uh, well, for someone obsessed with the Constitution, Keith Brown doesn't seem to understand <laughs> that the UK, government is, the UK government is responsible for monetary policy and interest rates, which are at record lows. The Scottish government is responsible for enterprise policy and economic growth, which is also at record lows. If, if the UK government is responsible for weak economic growth in Scotland, why is the rest of the UK growing three times faster than Scotland? <laughs> The reality is the fundamentals of the economy are not strong. As the Fraser of Alder have said, we are facing the longest period of weak growth for 60 years. With the Fiscal Commission forecasting further weak growth for the next four years, this budget should have been a programme for growth. It should have been about stimulating the economy, increasing productivity and reversing the decline in business investment. It should have been about closing the gap I've just explained with the rest of the UK, which will cost Scotland 16.5 billion of lost GDP between 2007 and 2021. But this budget does none of the above. Instead, the SNP has once again prioritised politics over the needs of the economy, and once again, they have joined forces with their Green Branch Office to deliver a budget that will damage the economy, depress productivity and discourage business investment. This budget will be damaging for the economy for the simple reason that increasing tax on a million workers will reduce disposable incomes in Scotland by a total of £220 million a year. In other words, that's £220 million a year going out of the economy. This will reduce consumption and reduce spending. The Scottish Retail Consortium has given the following example. A one pence increase in tax is equal to approximately 2% of retail sales. If that money is going into government coffers, it is likely to lead to further reductions in sales. The SRC, I will in a second, the SRC goes on to say, with a quarter of a million jobs in retail, any further fall in sales will have serious implications for the wider economy. We agree increasing tax in this budget will damage the economy. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, would you accept that when that money is recirculated, uh, for example, with more teachers and more nurses, they will spend the money and that, and that keeps the economy going? Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Based on the SNP's mismanagement over the past 10 years, I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever that a fraction of that money will find its way to the front line of services. We have seen countless overruns 
amounting to hundreds of millions of pounds on IT systems alone. So no, I don't share that view of John uh, Mason. Now, in terms of productivity, we saw last week that productivity in Scotland has declined for each of the last eight quarters. As a result, Scotland is at the bottom of the second quartile of OECD countries, more than 21% below the SNP's target to be in the top quartile. In contrast, numbers released today show that productivity for the UK economy as a whole has increased for the past two quarters at the fastest rate for 10 years. So we need to address this productivity challenge in Scotland. It's vital we keep existing workers, existing skilled workers, and attract even more. But this budget will make attracting skilled workers all the more difficult. For over a million skilled workers, it means a reduction in their net salary, a lower take-home wage than colleagues elsewhere in the UK. I need to make progress. That's why the Scottish Chamber of Commerce has warned that this budget will make Scotland a less attractive part of the UK for skilled employees and for business to recruit. By increasing tax on skilled workers, this budget will only exacerbate the low growth, low productivity and low income economy that the SNP has created over the past decade. Finally, on business investment, the budget imposes further costs on the struggling business sector in Scotland. By virtue of the increase in the poundage rate and the large business supplement alone, Scotland, uh, business in Scotland will be paying an extra £150 million a year. It should come as no surprise we have seen a 15% decline in business investment in the past year. Business in Scotland, after all, were promised £500 million of investment support under the Scottish Growth Scheme, which the First Minister described as a half a billion pounds vote of confidence in the Scottish economy to support business. 18 months later, we now know that only £25 million of assistance has been given to Scottish business. That's 5% of the investment support promised by the First Minister to uh, business in Scotland. With economic policies like this, it's no wonder the Scottish economy is facing the longest period of weak growth in 60 years. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me conclude by highlighting that this budget is not fit for purpose. Not only does it breach a central manifesto pledge made by the SNP, it doesn't come close to addressing the fundamental challenges faced by the Scottish economy. After 10 years of SNP mismanagement, we're now seeing the weakest growth for 60 years. This budget will only further damage the economy, and that's why it is time for a change of economic policy in Scotland. I call Kate Forbes, to be followed by Colin Smith. I'd like to remind the Chamber that I'm still the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I believe that there is a strong consensus across Scottish society in favour of investing in our common good. All sides of this chamber regularly make demands. Demands to invest more in our NHS, demands to build more housing and demands to strengthen broadband. And whilst there's definitely disagreement about how we fund it, there is agreement about the need to maintain or increase funding in the building blocks of healthcare, education and connectivity. And despite the challenging economic backdrop, this budget targets investment to meet the challenges of today and seize the opportunities of tomorrow. It's a budget for the farmer in Staffan, for the engineer in Drumnadrochet, for the doctor in Dingwall. Because people in the Highlands want reliable connectivity. And in this budget, there is a commitment to invest £600 million to support the R100 programme to deliver superfast broadband to 100% of residential and business properties. We want a well-resourced NHS Highland with more healthcare professionals. And this budget not only increases spending on health by over £400 million, but it also lifts the 1% public sector pay cap and provides a pay rise for NHS staff, the only place in the UK to do so. People in the Highlands want more and affordable homes. And in this budget, we are investing heavily in the provision of affordable housing with £756 million towards the £3 billion to build 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament. And it specifically maintains funding for rural and islands housing funds. We want improved roads and rail links. And this budget has £1.2 billion of investment in key road and rail projects 
including continuing the A9 duelling and upgrading the Highland Main Line between Perth and Inverness. It will also continue to progress design and development work on improvements to the A82 between Tarbet and Inverarnon. We want well-resourced education for our children and accessible further and higher education for young people. And not only is this budget still committed to free education across Scotland, it's providing £120 million directly to head teachers to reduce the impact of poverty on a child's education, educational attainment and invests nearly £2.4 billion in our colleges, universities and enterprise and skills bodies. And of course, we want to see economic growth. And with doubled funding for city region deals, support on business rates and a boost to businesses R&D funding, this budget is indeed trying to mitigate the deeply unsettling times that are fast approaching our economy as the UK government reduces our access to the talent pool and makes it harder for businesses to trade across borders. That is our budget. And that is the budget that every MSP will vote on in one way or another at 5pm today. That list of investment is not like Labour's unfunded, uncosted wish list. And it hasn't been magicked up by the Tories' incoherent plan to ask for more spending whilst reducing investment in public services by over £500 million. With changes to tax, there has been much talk about behavioural change, about how people will respond. That is a fair enough question. But, presiding officer, I strongly suspect that the stronger public services and the more inclusive society that this budget will build will have a behavioural impact because it will attract people to live, work and do business in Scotland. Last October, the IMF's tax report was clear. Excessive inequality erodes social cohesion. It leads to political polarisation and it ultimately leads to lower economic growth. And so this budget delivers three results. Firstly, it makes our taxation fairer by cutting taxes for 70% of taxpayers who earn under £33,000. Two, it raises additional revenue by asking those with the broadest shoulders to pay a little bit more. And three, critically, it targets funding to reduce inequality and to grow our economy. I'll take the intervention. I can allow you the time, Ms Forbes. Finlay Carson. Thank you. I wonder if the member can uh, confirm that actually in the year 2018-2019, this budget, that the broadband budget has actually dropped. Kate Forbes. This budget uh, allocate commits to the £600 million towards procurement, towards procurement of the R100 programme, which will deliver super-fast broadband across Scotland and does not commit to the shoddy 10 megabytes per second that the UK government is proposing. <laughs> Presiding officer, there is no question that we face challenges today. Between 2010-11 and 2019-20, 20, our discretionary budget allocation will have decreased by £2.6 billion. And the worst of the UK government's cuts are exacerbating inequality in Scotland. And we will face challenges in the future with widespread economic concerns about recruiting workers, with tighter immigration controls and accessing markets on a tariff-free Basis. It is in that context that this budget protects the NHS and public services, it supports low earners and it will unlock Scotland's economic potential. I do have a wee bit of time in hand so can allow some for interventions and I call Colin Smith to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. The inconvenient truth for every single SNP MSP and every Green MSP is that the budget they are going to rubber stamp later today will mean that right across Scotland, hundreds of local councillors of all political persuasions and none will in the days and weeks ahead have to decide which services in their community will be cut and which of their neighbours' jobs 
will be axed. The debate taking place in council chambers right now, right across Scotland, isn't about which services to trim, it's about which services to scrap. Now, I listened carefully to Patrick Harvey's contribution earlier to find out why the Greens were so desperate to be the SNP's cheerleaders in these attacks on our councils. All I heard, frankly, was complete denial and an appalling attempt by Patrick Harvey to try to blame other parties for his decision to sell out. Patrick Harvey argued... Patrick, I'll give away, yeah. Patrick Harvey. I, I'm grateful to the member. Our approach to the budget has secured a reversal of £170 million of local cuts. How much change has his party's approach made to the Scottish budget this year or last? Colin let Smith. Tell, let me tell just exactly what the reality is of Patrick Harvey's negotiations. Let me tell Patrick Harvey exactly what the reality of his negotiations are. He stands up and he says that as a result of a local government settlement that's rising by just 1.5%, there will be no cuts. Frankly, it defies, it defies the undeniable fact of this budget that if you, increase, if you increase burdens on local councils, but you don't give them the extra funds to meet those demands, councils need to cut existing services. And so far, Patrick Harvey has failed to acknowledge that. Let me explain to him. Let me explain to you what this means in simple terms for Mr Harvey. If I gave my four-year-old daughter five pounds to spend on sweeties last year, but this year I tell her I'm going to give her five pounds again, but she has to spend two pounds fifty on lemonade, she's going, to, she's going to say to me, I'll have to cut what I spend on sweeties. If my four-year-old daughter can get that basic fact, why can't Patrick Harvey get this basic fact at all? The budget fails. The budget fails to provide. The budget fails to provide extra funding for local government, but it does add additional extra burdens in relation to childcare, social care, and pay. But there is no additional funding to meet those extra burdens. Councils therefore have to cut existing spending on services. And it's frankly, it's dishonest of the SNP and the Greens to try to pretend otherwise. And the problem is, for local councils, it's not sweeties they're being forced to cut. It's the school crossing patrols that keep our children safe, which some people in the SNP seems to find amusing. It's the carers who look after their loved ones as if they were their own. It's the energy efficiency programmes, yes, to the Green Party, the energy efficiency programmes to tackle the scandal of fuel poverty that are not protected because they're funded by local councils facing cuts. And it's the learning support assistance acts from our classrooms because they're not part of this government's arbitrary teacher number targets. The addition of extra burdens without the... I'll give way to, to, to Mr Crawford. Yeah. Bruce Crawford. I thank Colin Smith for giving away. Yesterday, uh, the Labour spokesman for finance had conceded that the, to, to introduce your tourism tax and your land tax, you would need to put, bring in emergency legislation. Uh, uh, has any emergency legislation been drafted by the Labour Party? Have you produced any essential new IT systems, costings, any costings for new recruits, any identification of who the uh, collection agency would be or produced any necessary guidance and procedures? In fact, have you done anything at all? Colin Smith. The reality is the reason why a tourism tax has not been introduced is because this government do not have the political will to make the changes that will fund public services properly. The failure to, to, add up to, to, to face up to the fact that the extra burdens without extra cash is an underhand way to also increase central government ring fencing of local government. Now, we've had ring fencing before, but at least when previous governments brought in a new initiative, it came at a time of growing budgets with extra resources over and above the core local government grant. What is so perverse about the ring fencing supported in this budget by the SNP and Greens is it doesn't come with any new money whatsoever to fund it. The government are simply raiding the local government settlement, stealing cash from other council services, from commitments on teacher numbers to the Carers Act responsibilities. Hundreds of millions of pounds are being sucked from existing services because the Finance Secretary doesn't have the guts to raise the additional tax needed to deliver his own unfunded commitments. After five years of attacks and £1.5 billion of cuts to lifeline council services, the utter contempt with which this government views local government continues. Now, I can never quite work out just why the SNP have such disdain for local government and local councillors. It makes them so determined to attack the very services that the most vulnerable rely on most. I can only put it down to the obsessive centralist dictatorial way they want to run Scotland, where more and more decisions are made in Holyrood or rather Butte House and fewer and fewer are made in our local councils. Local government is seen by this government not as a partner, 
but as the enemy. When it comes to funding, there's no meaningful negotiations, just imposition. And if local government dares to call for better funding, the threat of removing funding further is waved in their face by the Finance Secretary. And this has all been done, frankly, by the SNP with the full support of the Greens. President Officer, keeping the Yes Coalition together is clearly far more important to the Greens than keeping local council services and jobs. But we know it doesn't have to be like this. We know that all those cuts supported by the SNP and Greens today can be avoided, all of them, not just some of them. This parliament now has the power to make different choices, to be genuinely progressive, to truly redistribute wealth, to say to the people of Scotland, if we want decent public services, we need to properly fund those services. What a real opportunity this budget could have been for progressive politics, for public services, and for the fight against the scandal of poverty in Scotland. An opportunity to free 30,000 children living in poverty out of the misery of austerity by increasing child benefit by just five pounds a week. A chance to stop all the cuts to our local council services and a chance to invest 500 million pounds more in our overstretched, under-resourced NHS. The SNP and Greens are good when it comes to the rhetoric of ending austerity, progressive taxation, wealth redistribution and reducing poverty. But this budget shows that they are found wanting when it comes to putting that rhetoric into practice. The modest tinkering on income tax by Derek Mackay raises a meagre £83 million more when you take off the cuts to business rates. That's just £83 million going into our public sector services. £83 million more and a budget of £32 billion. Now, earlier Derek Mackay deployed... No, you'll have to come to a close, please, Mr. Earlier Derek Mackay claimed that anybody voting against this budget is somehow voting against all government spending. The reality is, today we could have had a very different uh, budget. You'll have to come to a close, please, Mr Smith. Today we could have had a very different budget, a budget that stopped austerity cuts and stopped Mr. the Mr Smith, could you please come to a close? Their tracks. Thank you. Thank you. He did say... I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I hope and believe Parliament will approve spending plans to build a fairer and more prosperous Scotland, investing in our public services, our workers and our economy. Today we take another step towards delivering the bold and progressive agenda set out in the programme for government. MSP colleagues who will vote with the government demonstrate their commitment to developing stronger public services and a more inclusive society. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the Tories, their Labour brothers in arms and Willie Rennie's gang of three. First to that divided grouplet, the Orkney and Shetland party elected as active constituency members with traditional party support and their erstwhile mainland colleagues, the tactical voters, the vote for us not because you believe in us but to stop somebody else party. Legend has it that when Do Howard Carter prized open Tutankhamun's tomb back in 1922, he was mesmerised by treasures moulded in gold and carved in ivory, trumpets, weapons, clothing and all manner of wonders. An aged papyrus scroll caught his eye. Tentatively unfurled, he carefully deciphered the ancient hieroglyphics. One simple phrase emerged, a penny for education. <laughs> Through a millennia of war, revolution, reformation, pestilence and plague, fire and flood, that shekel, denarius, uh, uh, um, growth for education policy has remained sacred to a small, much despised and marginalised sect known to the ancients as Lib Dems. <laughs> Heretics say that it has only been policy since 1983 and much devalued by inflation since then, yet even though its architects have seen the policy ignored for decades and many of its early adherents moved to that big ballot box in the sky, its current high priest, St Willie of Rennie, who is here in his ghostly, if not actual, presence, <laughs> remains an avid devotee. Without making any effort to explain how, this wizened sage mystically claims its implementation would release 500 million for education, although the precise mechanism of how much would be allocated to each part of the system remains known only to the truest of cult members. Certainly, this lazy thinking has not been explained to Parliament or the people of Scotland. If only this tiny group of latter-day magi spent as much time explaining the budget as they do following the letter, if not the spirit, of the law in relation to election expenses in their target seats. <laughs> I must admit, I was a little bewildered by the Tory party political broadcast which aired earlier this month. Apart from Annie, Annie Wells, there was little sign of the familiar Tory faces we know and love here at Holyrood, and they said it was a showcase of Ruth's warm, couthy, more proletarian Tories. It's frankly insulting that the Tories believe that the electorate don't need to hear their policy ideas, tax proposals, or indeed the failure of the 13 Tory MPs from Scotland to represent Scottish interests at Westminster. Do the Tories really believe people will be convinced they have changed simply because Annie Wells used to work at Marks and Spencers or because Bill Crant MP's late failure was a minor? 
I think in the next broadcast we need to hear the authentic voice of tourism in Scotland. Donald Cameron, 27th Lochiel, discussing the trials and tribulations of being a clan chief in 21st century Scotland, are debating with Alexander Burnett, who is the most aristocratic heritage, and whether Harrow's polo team was better than Eaton's or Sir Edward Mountain, bewailing the difficulties in finding a good butler these days, or Peter Chapman wistfully reminiscing about the four farms he jointly owned prior to becoming an MSP. In the next broadcast, Tory voters need to be reassured that still the same old party of vested interest, landed wealth and privilege it has always been. Or if we must have Bill Grant rather than polishing road signs, yes, he could explain why he not only refuses to support the 4,000, I'll let her in, don't you worry, the 4,750 Waspy Women's and his constituency and sign the Women Against State Pension and Equality Pledge. He actually fell asleep on the green benches during Westminster's debate on the matter back in December. In any case, I hope retired firefighter Bill Grant will join me in welcoming this budget which will protect police and fire services and work to ensure they retain in full the savings created from now being able to reclaim VAT as well as returning the £140 million already taken from these services by the UK Tory government. I yield to the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party who Nicholas Soames has been wandering up and down Westminster declaring Ruth Davidson is not getting my mid-Sussex seat, Ms Davidson. <laughs> Ruth Davidson, I would like to ask the member if such a long diatribe on individual members of my party, does he think it shows more the reason why he's never graced the front benches of his own party or more the reason why he's got nothing to say about his own party's budget? <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Gibson. A wee bit of deja vu, that's not the first time you've used that line, Ruth, so uh, you need to think up some new ones as we go forward. I'm going to be, I'm talking about the budget, but the point is it's the kind of false face that your party's presenting to the people of Scotland, which I find most irksome. Meanwhile, Labour has again been too preoccupied with infighting and political manoeuvring to make any meaningful contribution to the budget process. Perhaps Jackie Bailey won't take Murdo Fraser up on his Valentine offer to join the Conservative Party, but the way Labour MSPs vote with the Tories against the SNP government, one might be forgiven to get in the pair confused. Jeremy Corbyn MP ventured up to North Britain last week to meet a select group of acolytes whilst having a wee pop at the SNP and austerity. Perhaps someone should gently remind them that in fact Labour introduced uh, point austerity... Point of order, John Scott. I'm just wondering what relevance any of Mr Gibson's speech has had to the budget debate at all. It's been a diatribe, as Ruth Davidson has said, against named individuals, low blows in this par Parliament, and absolutely nothing to do with the motion uh, under consideration today. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, uh, Mr Scott, that Mr Gibson's about to enlighten us on that, but it wasn't actually a point of order. I'd like to thank my Ayrshire colleague. I'm sorry I haven't mentioned you in any of my speeches this year. We'll perhaps do that later on this in further debates. But uh, uh, Labour, of course, introduced the austerity while still in government at Westminster, have consistently failed to oppose Tory welfare cuts and saying. And in fact, what was interesting was that in James Kelly's opening speech, he didn't criticise the Tory government's cut to this Parliament's budget once. Call it you want, cognitive dissonance, collective amnesia, I prefer outright hypocrisy. Presiding officer, today Labour and the Tories will vote against investing in childcare. They'll vote against improving our schools and hospitals. They'll vote against protecting our public services and, and they will vote against a fairer society for all. It's important to bear in mind that 70% of Scots will actually pay less tax the coming year than they do now. This might be difficult for the opposition to spin away when they explain to their constituents why they voted against today's budget, but it's a fact nonetheless. By diverging from the UK on tax, we can better protect our public sector services that are free at the point of use, including free prescriptions, free personal care and indeed free higher education, uh, which many MSPs of other close, parties' please, children benefit from. Our investment will help reduce the attainment gap, double free childcare, deliver 50,000 uh, additional homes and £600 million in, broad in, in, in broadband. Uh, please support this budget today to deliver first, last and always for the people of Scotland. I'm going to first of all apologise to Mr Scott because that was in fact a point of order. Um, I think Mr Scott will be pleased that relevance did come eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I now call Miles Briggs to be followed by Ruth McGuire. I think that's very debatable, presiding officer. But anyway, um, if there's anything we've heard from that, I don't think the member will be in the SNP's next party political broadcast with Nicola Sturgeon. But we'll put that there. I want to focus my comments today on, in terms of what the budget means for our NHS in Scotland. The Finance Secretary and the SNP government have been boasting about record health spending. But for some reason, they never want to refer to the fact that a significant part of that extra health spending spending is now directly linked to the Barnet consequential fund funding this government receives. And since the UK Conservative government took the decision to protect health spending, this has amounted to some £2.154 billion in extra spending since 2011 that the Scottish government has for our health service. So how are, no, I've just started, so but later on. So how is the overall spending on our NHS across UK nations actually performing? Official statistics show in recent years, because of the decisions by SNP ministers, health spending in Scotland is rising roughly half the rate of that in England. So while health spending in England has increased by around 10% between 2012 and 2016, it's only increased by 5%. Would Ben McPherson like to maybe tell me the answer to that? Thank you, President. Thank no, you, you haven't said anything yet, but I have now. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President. Thank you, Miles Briggs, for taking the intervention. Miles Briggs speaking, uh, I think, positively in favour of spending on the NHS. So perhaps you can explain to the Chamber today why he is likely to vote against £400 million extra spending for the NHS and why the Scottish Conservatives' tax proposals of taking £501 million out of the Scottish revenue budget would cut... 12,000 nurses from the Scottish NHS. Thank you, Perhaps thank you. Like uh, can, I just say for that. Uh, can I just say to Mr Briggs, don't stand up while another person is still intervening. Please wait till you're called. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think in terms of what I've already answered, the £2.154 billion, pounds, which has come to Scotland from a UK Conservative government, is, I would even say, for SNP politicians, a bit of a drop in the ocean um, from what they are saying um, is not being put into our health service. We have invested across the United Kingdom in our health service. It's a record we're proud of. It's whether or not SNP ministers are going to take this forward. And it's worth listening, if they won't listen to me, to Professor Jim Gallagher, who, whose authoritative public spending in Scotland report from September this year concluded and emphasised that in 2006, Scotland had a health lead of 16% over England, but by 2016, this lead had reduced to just 7.5%. To repeat, this has not been caused by overall squeeze on the Scottish budget, but the priority choices of SNP ministers, who've given less of the priority spend to our health service than the budget as a whole. But how will this impact on our NHS? Within this SNP Green budget for the NHS next year, there's a big cut to NHS capital spending of almost £67 million. This is the, despite the well-documented backlog of maintenance repairs across NHS Scotland's estate, which is estimated to now stand at over £900 million. And the fact that a proportion of significant buildings now within our NHS are deemed at high risk and maintenance has increased. The high... Very briefly... Cabinet Secretary. Can Miles Briggs explain how the NHS would cope if I had to see through the £211 million uh, reduction next year in resource from the UK government and on top of that a further £556 million reduction that I would need to find from Scotland's public services if I followed the Tory tax plans? Mr Briggs. I think the SNP members are completely forgetting what I've said already. Two, over £2 billion in additional money has come to our health service. How this government decides to prioritise that has been this government's decision making. And what I want to talk about specifically and welcome from the uh, Cabinet Secretary today is the comments he said on Frank's floor. I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is finally working with stakeholders to prepare for the implementation of this change. I therefore like, very much like to hear more about how, how much is being provided and what he has said in terms of preparing for the implementation as when he sums up today. Because for over 9,000 Scots ac across our country, Frank's law is needed today. It was needed yesterday. So I hope we will see this delivered as soon as possible. And as my party leader, Ruth Davidson, has said, he and the SNP will have our support to do that and bring it forward as soon as possible. And it is specifically because of this that we need to take action. We all know the demographic challenges which our country is facing. In Edinburgh alone, the number of people aged over 85 is expected to double by, by 2032 to over 19,000. The number who require intensive levels of support will increase by 60%, and the number of people living with dementia is projected to increase by 25% over the next 10 years to over 10,000. 
This SNP budget, though, doesn't offer any long-term thinking on how we address the ever-increasing demands of our social care system, which already cannot cope with the current levels of demand. The overriding of all this is the fact that probably the biggest threat to the future investment in our NHS and in our social care system is the pitiful economic growth which we are seeing in Scotland. SNP ministers seem to be in denial about how no, these growth rates and low growth rates um, are not actually increasing the tax take we see in Scotland. And we're, this is something which SNP ministers in future budgets are going to be responsible for. And I think the people of Scotland will judge them on that. Instead of boosting our Scottish economy and making Scotland a more attractive and competitive place to work and live and invest, this budget hikes taxes and sends out the wrong message that Scotland is a high tax country. Indeed, SNP income tax rises, even without the council tax rise, which most Scots will experience, are the highest income, ta income tax rises on Scots for over 40 years. The Labour Party in this chamber and Jeremy Corbyn may be preaching the failed economics of the 1970s, but they are being delivered by the SNP government in Holyrood today. Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe this budget will go down as another staging post in the journey of pub the public in Scotland losing, face in this SNP, lo losing faith in this SNP government. From their mismanagement of our public services to their seemingly indifference to wanting to grow and create a positive economy in Scotland. In the coming years, we'll see increasing numbers of people find they are paying more and receiving less. This SNP government has no new ideas to grow our economy and it's making Scottish taxpayers pay the price for their failure. Failure to stimulate and grow our Scottish economy and our public services will be the ones which bear the brunt of this slow growth in the future. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland does Yes, deserves Mark, you must better. conclude. I will do. Scotland deserves better than this. It's time for a Scottish Government that understands that economic success is fundamental to a sustainable public Thank you. Service. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Jenny Mara. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This budget is bold and progressive and delivers for families and communities across Scotland. This budget is a clear example of the fact that where we have the powers here in Scotland, we're making different choices from those pursued by the callous Tory government at Westminster. The Scottish Tories would happily follow their lead, cutting tax for the highest earners and creating a £500 million black hole in our public finances. Fortunately for the people of Scotland, although we can't control what the Tories do at Westminster, in power in Scotland, we can and we are making different choices. Scotland will be the fairest tax part of the UK with the best deal for taxpayers, allowing us to mitigate Tory cuts, invest in our NHS, protect our public services and grow the economy. Under the progressive tax reforms, 70% of taxpayers will pay less than last year, while high earners will face a modest increase. These tax changes will allow the Scottish Government to increase health spending by 400 million to 13.6 billion, lift the public sector pay gap and provide a substantial package of investment in the economy and in tackling poverty and social inequalities. This is good news for people across Scotland and in particular in my Cunningham South constituency, one of the areas suffering most under Tory austerity. No. North Ayrshire is a council area with amongst the highest rates of poverty in Scotland, alongside Glasgow and Dundee. In Irvine West, one third of children are living in poverty. This statistic should shock and shame us as policymakers. However, Irvine West is more than this statistic, and it demands only admiration for the resilience of the communities living and working there. We all know that the Tory-imposed austerity is one of the main reasons behind rising child poverty. To quote from the introduction of the Ayrshire and Arran NHS Board's 2017 report, The State of Child Health, Spotlight on Child Poverty and Welfare Reform, child poverty is predicted to increase significantly in Scotland during the lifetime of the current UK Parliament, largely due to welfare reform. The Scottish Tories' budget plans would further exacerbate this dire situation, taking a further £500 million out of the public purse. In stark contrast to the Tories' plans to slash tax for the highest earners whilst cutting support for the poorest, the SNP budget will mitigate austerity and tackle inequalities. And in stark contrast to Labour's rhetoric of doom and gloom, which criticises everything whilst offering few solutions for anything, we will take concrete action to improve people's life. Negative rhetoric alone doesn't help anyone. Please sit down, Ms Lennox. Apparently the member is not giving me. 
Negative rhetoric alone doesn't help anyone, presiding officer, and it does a disservice to the folk living in our communities with the greatest challenges. Yeah. What will help my constituents is the £100 million that this government will spend mitigating UK welfare cuts next year, including £50 million to mitigate the callous bedroom tax. What will help my constituents is a tackling child poverty fund worth £50 million over the period of the child poverty delivery plan. What will help my constituents is £1.5 million of investment in a family financial health check guarantee to help families with children get all the money that they're entitled to and to access the best deals on financial products, services and energy bills. What will help my constituents is a £1.5 million Fair Food Fund, which will see the Scottish Government work with national and local partners to ensure everyone can access healthy, nutritious food in dignified ways. The expansion of free early years childcare will help my constituents. The new Best Start grant to provide financial support to low-income families will also help, as will the Baby Box, giving that practical support to new parents and making sure that every baby in Scotland has the essentials that they need. It could go on, presiding officer, but the point is clear. Within the limited confines of the political and economic powers that it has, this SNP Scottish Government is getting on with the job of taking concrete steps to significantly improve the lives of people of Scotland. As well as the bold central government initiatives, this government has ensured that local government will receive an above inflation increase in resource funding. For North Ayrshire, this means a budget boost of an extra £4 million to spend on local services to improve the lives of my constituents in Cunningham South. It means more money to spend on things like employability hubs, school clothing grants and free school meal provision during the holidays as well as in term time. It means more money to pursue projects like the Poverty Challenge Fund that focuses specifically on preventative measures to support those most likely to experience poverty. Or the funding being used to establish community food programmes to explore how more sustainable models of local and dignified food provision can be developed. Or the funding that will develop North Ayrshire's Fair for All strategy to reduce inequalities. An increased health spending will allow NHS Ayrshire and Arran to continue to build on Excellent initiatives like the integrated working taking place between midwives and income maximisation specialists within H NHS Ayrshire and Arran to increase income for pregnant women and their families. Presiding officer, voting against the Scottish budget will be a vote against investing in childcare, in our schools, in hospitals and in other public services, giving them the funds that they need to deliver better services for all of Scotland. Voting for this budget is a vote for a different path and a better future for the people of Scotland than the one being imposed on them by the Tories in Westminster. I know what side I'm on. Thank you. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms Mara, please. Presiding officer, let me start from where Ruth Maguire uh, finished there because I'm sure she'll agree with me that far too often in this chamber we talk about the symptoms of poverty rather than the causes and the uh, cabinet secretary won't be surprised that I want to spend my time today talking about his sports tax that he has put on local communities right across the country. And I link it to Ms Maguire's comments because I was speaking to a sports expert just yesterday who said to me that this sports tax that Derek Mackay is putting on our communities makes the delivery of the prevention agenda in the Christie Commission very, very difficult. Presiding officer, the Barclay Review proposal to end rates relief for local authorities' arm's length organisations are of real concern. These organisations run a huge range of sport, leisure and cultural services and they qualify for rates relief. Indeed, Alios, and the Cabinet Secretary knows this, were initially set up for tax purposes so councils would have a bit more cash to provide much needed sport and leisure facilities. But today, Derek Mackay, in his budget, is going to give us a sports tax in Scotland that will make it far more difficult for councils to build new sports halls and libraries. Now, astonishingly to me, part of the rationale behind the Barclay proposals were that Alios have an unfair competitive advantage over private leisure providers. Let me quote from the Barclay Review. Alios create unfair competition between the public and private sectors. On the grounds of fairness, we believe there should be a level playing field and council alios should no longer be able to abuse the system. Frankly, I think this admission is uh, very, very surprising. I want to ask Derek Mackay today if he accepts this argument 
that there is um, this unfair competition. Because if he does, I say to him that as he is accepting right-wing ideology in his public policy for local authorities. Now, yes. Secretary. Can I thank uh, Jenny Mara for taking the intervention and for absolute clarity I'm not implementing the Barclay recommendation as it relates to allies as the Chamber knows fine well but as a committee convener and a Labour MSP would Jenny Mara explain how it can be as a committee convener uh, the member has written to me demanding to know how I address the deficit in the NDR pool but as a Labour member supporting the Labour budget I sustain that deficit in the NDR pool. You can't have it both ways. Jenny Mara. Mr Mackay knows very well what the Labour proposals are on taxation in this budget and we would not have to make this cut. He knows perfectly well what he's doing with this sports tax. He is top slicing the, the grant that local authorities get for this money. He says that there is unfair competition between private providers and alios, but I can guarantee him that there have been no planning applications from private gym providers in inner city Dundee. And as he well knows, the money isn't there to make these facilities work. Now, it's the philosophy of this party, presiding officer, that government steps in to provide public amenities, not just in the communities that most need them, but across the board to provide equal and high quality sporting and cultural opportunities. No, the SNP would have us believe that they share this philosophy. I'll take you in a minute if I can make some progress. But it has happened many times in this chamber before, and you only need to look at the detail of what they are actually doing to see the reality. Let me spell out the effects of Mr Mackay's sport ta sports tax in case anyone is in any doubt. Late last week, Mr Mackay found a fix for the Regional Performance Centre in Dundee. He had to. His decision to take tax relief from Alios was more than doubling the operating costs of the planned centre. Indeed, his £800,000 tax grab on the centre left a question mark hanging over its viability. Now, even if it had remained viable, these costs would have been passed on to the people using the centre. So he fixed that problem in Dundee, and that is very welcome. But his policy still stands for the rest of the country and for other projects in Dundee. I'll take you in a minute, Mr Harvey. The new community, the new tennis centre in Inverclyde, who knows what's going to happen to that now? The new community centre and library in Minas Hill in Dundee, who knows what will happen to that now? Because all of these councils will have to find thousands more to fund these facilities, and the Cabinet Secretary knows this. As the councils this week pass their budgets, I'm happy to take an intervention, Mr Fitzpatrick. They pair their services back to the bone. Where will they find the cash for these new facilities? I doubt it. Cabinet Secretary, yes. Well, the member was in her last minute, so it must be brief on both sides. Thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful. Does the Labour Party having welcomed the fact that this Barclay recommendation won't be fully implemented, does the Labour Party still acknowledge that there remains an issue around accountability and that we should be creating incentives to bring services back into democratic, accountable control rather than seeing more and more assets transferred into alleys? Uh, briefly, please, I Ms. agree Mara. there is an issue around accountability, but what this proposal does is make councils find more money to build sports halls and libraries. It is completely unacceptable. Presiding officer, the poorest council areas in Scotland created alios because they needed the relief to build community facilities. That need has not gone. It remains and is greater than ever. And I really hope that he will, he will uh, look again at this regressive tax. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Liz Smith. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak in the final debate before Parliament votes on the Scottish Government's budget. A budget, though, budget that will benefit all who live in the Renfrewshire South constituency that I am honoured to represent in this Parliament. When I vote for this budget, I will be voting for over £1.8 million of people equity funds to go directly to schools across Renfrewshire South. £121,000 for Carly Bar Primary and £109,000 for St Mark's Primary both in my hometown of Barhead, £104,000 for Johnson High School in the town where my constituency office is based, and £141,000 for Woodlands Primary, and £190,000 for the River Bray Special School, both in Linwood, a town that was cast in the scrap heap by a previous Tory government, but is now 10 years into a regeneration process begun by an SNP-led Renfrewshire Council 
under my colleague Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, schools of a length and breadth of my Ryan Fisher South constituency and across Scotland have and will continue to benefit from attainment funds. I've had the privilege of meeting with staff and pupils from across my constituency and have seen firsthand the benefits of PEF money through a range of interventions such as specialised staff and additional activities which enrich and enhance the learning environment. Presiding officer, I also wish to put on record my support for the government's continued investment in the NHS. An additional £400 million in this budget, taking total health spending to some £13.1 billion. And as the son of a nurse and a NHS Estates Officer, both now retired, I am delighted at this government's commitment to lifting the public sector pay cap. President Officer, there is one further point I wish to make on health spending, and that is how it is spent and the funda fundamental importance of how spending decisions are made in health. It is my view that one of the SNP government's finest achievements was the delivery of the publicly owned Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. And I wish in particular to highlight the £40 million of investment over recent years in the Institute of Neurological Sciences on the Queen Elizabeth campus. This is a worldwide centre of excellence and pr that practices cutting edge medicine. And I know this directly. In May of last year, presiding officer, my brother collapsed at his home in Barhead. He was rushed by ambulance to the RAH. There he received exemplary treatment by the accident and emergency care team and the on-call consultant who suspected a brain hemorrhage. My brother was then quickly transferred by ambulance to the Institute of Neurological Sciences at the Queen Elizabeth campus where a subarachnoid hemorrhage was diagnosed. Within a matter of hours, he was in surgery. Having lost a close friend to subarachnoid hemorrhage a few years ago, my family and I feared the worst. However, presiding officer, three weeks later, my brother was back in college and passing exams with flying colours. His remarkable recovery was made possible by the incredible NHS staff who treated him. These staff, in turn, benefited from a government that invests money in our health service and, crucially, listens to the advice of clinicians on how that money should be invested. Presiding officer, before concluding, I, I wish also to reiterate my backing for this budget support for our creative sector, particularly given the reductions from the National Lottery. I also wish to commend the decision to significantly increase the economy portfolio budget and continue support for small business, demonstrating that this government is indeed one that is determined to support economic growth. All of this, however, has been achieved against the negative actions of the UK government. President officer, the UK government is cutting the Scottish government's resource budget by some £500 million over the next two years. This, as everyone but the Tories seem to understand, is the budget that pays for the day-to-day -day running of our public services. This also includes paying the salaries of public sector employees like nurses, firefighters and police officers. This £500 million budget reduction in itself should also be understood in the broader context of almost a decade of austerity implemented by the UK government. This is a challenge not only to the government, but to all of us in this place, which is, after all, a parliament of minorities. And I commend the Greens for their pragmatism and for rising to this challenge. It's disappointing, but unsurprising, that Labour chose not to engage constructively in this process. As for the Tories, they have failed, ultimately, to produce a fiscally and politically coherent proposition. Now, Tories, of course, reflexively wish to slash taxes for high earners and shrink the state. Now, I fundamentally disagree with this approach, but it does at least represent a school of thought that can be subject, subjected to scrutiny and debate. However, the current Tory proposition of simultaneously calling for tax cuts on the one hand and increased public spending warrants not debate, but ridicule. <laughs> Presiding officer, in the end, politics comes down to values and choices. And nowhere does this become more apparent than in the setting of a budget. The reality is that the Tories won't admit what they cut, and Labour don't have a set of proposals that would meet the rigorous standards of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. In contrast, this budget put forward by Derek Mackay shows a government that puts progressive values into action. A government that is committed to protecting and strengthening public services. A government that supports business and economic growth. And a government committed to ensuring that every child has the opportunity to succeed. This is a budget that works for my constituents in Renfrewshire South and for all of Scotland, and I look forward to supporting it this evening. Thank you very much. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Ivan McKee, and Mr McKee will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
I think uh, perhaps this uh, stage three budget debate should be put in the context of the divergence in the comments that have been made by the finance secretary and those from economic commentators. Because since stage one on the 31st of January, there have been wildly different interpretations of what is really happening on the ground. Now, summing up yesterday on the rate resolution debate, the finance secretary was trumpeting the underlying strength of the Scottish economy. Specifically, he mentioned improving productivity levels, rising output, GVA, improving median weekly earnings and foreign direct investment. But if you look in more detail at Mr Mackay's budget, as obviously many of the economic commentators have done, there is another part of the story which relates to the overall direction of travel. All of it set against the most recent analysis undertaken by the OECD, which clearly exposed the extent of the economic issues facing Scotland as a result of the projected poor rates of economic growth. And despite all the spin that Mr Mackay can muster, the overall tax burden of this budget will rise. Hence the reason why the commentators have a rather different perspective from Mr Mackay. And the other context of this debate is about how well we spend our money. It's not just about tax revenues and how much we collect from our hard-pressed taxpayers, because it's a debate about the general well-being of business and industry as they plan their investment, their jobs and their trading operations. It's not just about our taxpayers and the demand side of the economy, because it's also about the supply side. So let's take a look at each in turn. On the demand side, the Scottish Retail Consortium has made it very plain that the overall increases in tax on working people will make it harder to persuade the public to spend more of their money in shops and local businesses. Now, many of us in this chamber, perhaps all of us, are representing constituencies with small towns and high streets which are already struggling. Empty premises, threatened closures and shops that are really struggling to make ends meet. And many of these towns also include businesses with a rateable value of over £51,000 who are facing large business supplement of 2.6% in Scotland, whereas it's 1.3% for their counterparts in England. These businesses need all the help that they can get and the public with their SNP's tax plans are having a real hard time of it. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. Thank Liz Smith for taking that intervention. Will the member therefore explain why she'll oppose the support package of around £720 million in terms of non-domestic rates relief tonight? Ms Smith. Cabinet Secretary, we've been very clear that this budget is not doing nearly enough to ensure that business is competitive and properly investing in the things that we need to have in Scotland to ensure that we sustain that economic growth. That's the reason. Now, what is it exactly that business leaders have been saying in their warnings? They're making the point that the SNP's commitment to a higher tax Scotland makes it much harder to attract the necessary talent and the necessary investment at a time when Scotland's economy is already growing at a lower rate than the rest of the UK. The OECD and the Scottish Fiscal Commission analyses do not make for good reading. The latter is making it very clear indeed that between 2018 and 2022, the Scottish economy is not expected to grow by more than 1%. For these business leaders, the introduction of the new tax band at 21% on incomes between 24,000 and 43,430 is unwelcome since it means that despite all the rhetoric from Mr Mackay, the burden of tax in Scotland will be greater than it is in the rest of the UK. And that widening of that tax gap is a serious issue for them, quite rightly so. And it's that perception that matters, as well as the reality. And we know that from the Barclay Review, when the uh, end to eight rates relief that Alio's that the Cabinet Secretary was proposing, we know that he was going to go ahead with that until he felt the full force of the public and the fact that that was not going to be acceptable. And I think Jenny Mara, who's not in the chamber just now, but she makes a very good point about what the futures are for some of the new alleos. Because if it, at any stage we're going to have um, put in jeopardy any of these new projects, we've got to have a serious look at what the implications are for that investment and on building for our future, particularly for young people in this year of young people, which is very important. And whilst on the Barclay Review, Cabinet Secretary, can I repeat my plea that you really do have to think carefully about the implications of your tax plans on nursery provision, particularly in light of what we saw last week from the Accounts Commission report and indeed yesterday from Fair Funding for Our Kids, who are talking a lot 
about the accessibility of nursery places. It's not just about the provision of more places, but it's about whether they can actually be accessed. And the Scottish Government seems to think that it is sensible to pursue plans which will allow private profit-making nurseries to enjoy 100% of rates relief, but not the nurseries that are charitable and not-for-profit and which help out local authorities to deliver that greater flexibility in places in the nurseries. That does not make any sense. I don't think it makes any sense to this chamber and it certainly doesn't make any sense to parents. The long and short, Cabinet Secretary, is that it is the SNP's inability to sustain this budget because it does not have the necessary economic growth behind it. And that's a message that you have been told time and time again, not just from the Conservatives, but from business in Scotland. And it is no use at all for the Finance Minister to say that Brexit is to bl blame for all of this. It's not, because Brexit is happening to the rest of the UK too. This debate is about the SNP's stewardship of the economy. And just about every economic forecaster is telling Mr Mackay that he is making huge errors of judgment. Worse still, that he is harming the ability of Scotland to be the most competitive and most successful part of the UK, which is exactly why the Scottish Conservatives will not be supporting this budget. Thank you. I call Ivan McKee, the last speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As the series of debates on this year's Scottish budget draws to a close after what seems like an eternity, it's perhaps time to take stock of where we are. We've heard much in contributions today and yesterday's deliberations on the rates resolution and in earlier budget debates on the details of the government's spending tax proposals. How much extra has been spent on the various portfolios, how much has been raised and where from. We've had alternative proposals being advanced, different economic theories and varying perspectives on the impacts of tax and spend. Some it has to be said more grounded in reality than others. The Laffer curve in all its manifestations has had a good airing and is about to be put safely back in its box for a period of rest and recuperation in preparation for next year's budget cycle. And we have seen tax income elasticities and differential marginal propensity to consume emerge onto the scene as new contenders for the Economic Jargon of Choice Award. Interest groups and respected independent bodies have been quoted endlessly. The full alphabet soup of trade bodies, third sector organisations and think tanks have been deployed to support arguments on all sides. The Fraser of Allender in particular, it must be said, has seen its stock rise yet again, being quoted against itself from opposite sides of the chamber at the same time on more than one occasion. The intense heat generated by the debate has even managed to generate enough free energy to split that most compact political entity of them all, the Scottish Liberal Democrats. So maybe it's time to reflect on the wider politics of all of this. What is the perspective of those outside the bubble? The pairs of tax, the consumers of services. What do the women and men in the street take away from their deliberations over recent weeks? Taxpayers at different levels of income may or may not notice a shift in their take-home pay. In most cases up and some down. They will understand that the income tax system in Scotland is now different from that down south. They will also understand better that other taxes are different too. The gap in council tax levels north and south of the border continues to widen in their favour. Sure. Miles Briggs. Taking that intervention, when he next sees the man and woman in the street in his constituency, will he tell them he broke his pledge not to raise tax? Yeah. Ivan McKee. What I'll tell them is that the vast majority of people in my constituency are going to see a tax reduction as a consequence <laughs> of this budget. <laughs> The tax changes in this budget have been carefully tailored to minimise the chances of anyone altering their tax affairs or moving house to save that extra penny in the pound, especially when the higher council tax on their new house down south would wipe out any income tax gain. Future analysis by the Scottish Fiscal Commission will attempt to quantify the value of tax loss due to behavioural change, but I expect it will be minimal. Public sector workers will see the different approach to the way the pay cap has been handled by different governments across the UK. And the narrative that business investors will be driven away by a penny in the pound has, I believe, been overplayed. I know from my own experience that the factors that determine business investment decisions are wide and varied, but that levels of personal income tax come down, low down that list 
far behind infrastructure, skills availability, business taxes and government support. The debate has also perhaps caused taxpayers to reflect on what they get for their money. Services that are free north of the border because money down south have been highlighted once more. The quality of those public services have been contrasted with provisions across the rest of the UK. Those who use our health services and those who work in them increasingly hear of the problems besetting the services in England and Wales and understand that the service in Scotland is different. The concept of you get what you pay for, or in more technical terms, negative price elasticity of demand, is possibly the most common refrain in the public debate over past days. People feel instinctively comfortable with that concept. Most are willing to pay more to get more. The challenge, of course, for our public services is to ensure this trust is not mistreated, that perceived value is indeed delivered for the extra spend, to continue to shift the focus to preventative spend, to increasingly focus on outcomes and not just on inputs, in line with the principles of the Christie Commission. I would suggest, presiding officer, that when the dust settles, we'll see a stronger Scottish Parliament, a Parliament taking, as the SCDI put it, a mature, progressive and significant approach to deploying its new tax powers. I expect that the people of Scotland will see that and will understand that a major step has been taken in the direction of making this place yet more relevant to their daily lives. The perception that this place now matters more, not just in the service delivery portfolios, but also in relation to take-home pay, has been reinforced. The understanding that Scotland is different has also been reinforced. That we are able to take a distinctively Scottish approach to how we found our, fund our public services and how we raise that money to pay for them. In conclusion, presiding officer, while last year's budget was historic, with new powers being available for the first time, this year's budget has been even more significant as it shows the Parliament starting to use those powers. But even more importantly, it is yet another significant step on the road to creating a Parliament with all the powers needed to run all aspects of our country and our economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McKee. Move to closing speeches. I call on Monica Lennon to close for Labour, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary opened by saying this budget is putting progressive values into action. If only it was true, because despite all the backslapping we've seen during this debate, this budget fails to protect the most vulnerable people in our society. It does not raise enough revenue and it fails every one of Scottish Labour's five budget tests. It doesn't halt austerity, it won't stop the growth of poverty, it doesn't redistribute power or wealth and it won't grow our economy in the interests of the many, not the few. The alternative plan to Scottish Labour put forward passes every one of these tests. I'm sorry Patrick Harvey feels he didn't have enough time to consider them. But we would raise almost a billion pounds of extra stimulus for the Scottish economy, meaning that we can. And Bruce Crawford, Bruce Crawford asked the Chamber to consider the type of nation we want to be. So we have a, a prospectus that would save lifeline local services, would fund a pay rise for public sector workers, would put money in the pockets of working families by topping up child benefit by £5 per week and would deliver extra spending for the National Health Service. Our costed alternative is proof of what a difference this Parliament could make if only the SNP had the political will to make the choices for real progressive change rather than continue to tinker around the edges. Ruth Maguire made some important points about the scandalous levels of child poverty, but it's a pity she didn't take the intervention to, to agree with the trade unions and charities in her constituency and indeed across Scotland that child benefit, the top up that we propose, would end uh, or would lift 30,000 children out of poverty immediately. Our alternative tax plans would raise more than 540 million, more than the current proposals in the budget, whilst ensuring that the richest pay their fair share and 70% of taxpayers wouldn't pay a penny more. Our plans, just like the SNP's, ensure that those earning up to £33,000 won't pay a penny more in tax than they do just now. But the difference is that unlike the SNP, our plans ask the very richest in our society to pay their fair share. By dropping the threshold for the 45 pence rate to 60,000 and introducing a new 50p rate for those earning over 100,000, our proposals would raise vital money for public services. 
I'll take Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs, please. Intervention. It's now widely accepted that Labour's proposal of 50p tax rate would actually lose money. And so can the member confirm she would like to support and the party supports a policy which would lose money to the Scottish taxes? Monica Lennon. I don't accept that. There's no evidence for that, but there's a, a shared perception between the SNP front bench and the Tory back bench. Simply, this is about progressive taxation. We are asking, we're not embarrassed to be asking those who can afford to pay a bit more to do so, something that the SNP used to believe in. Because despite manifesto after manifesto promise from the SNP supporting, agreeing that we should have a 50p rate of tax, the government is now sheepish when it comes to explaining why it's been that promise. Our 50p tax rate for £100,000 earners means someone on 150 grand would be paying £142 more per week in income tax. The SNP simply asked them to pay £17 more. So the bottom line is that the SNP's tax plans are timid and it's not going to solve austerity. Because central to our additional stimulus package is the extra funding for local government, which has been unfairly squeezed year after year of budget negotiations since 2011. COSLA have stated that local authorities need £545 million to protect lifeline services. And that's what our funding package is all about. Because cuts to local services mean cuts to vital local services. And that's what's having an impact on people in their everyday lives. Colin Smith spoke about the dilemma facing local councillors of all political parties. And Jenny Mara raised the importance of preventative spending, which I know a lot of people in this chamber agree with, but they're looking another, another way when it's been raised. The Scottish Government claims that councils are getting a fair deal, something we've heard time and time again. But the Cabinet Secretary is failing to take responsibility to explain why 9 out of 10 austerity job losses have come from local councils. And indeed, 28,000, and it's not a scaremongering Cabinet Secretary, it is a fact that 28,000 local government posts have been cut in the last seven years. What a disgrace! It, it has to be brief, Cabinet Secretary. Simply why Monica Lennon will oppose the real terms increase going to local government as a consequence of this budget. Monica Lennon. I thought the Cabinet Secretary was going to maybe correct his earlier um, misleading of Parliament when he said that 28,000 cuts to local jobs was scaremongering. But we're about putting money into public services, not, not taking it out. Presiding officer, I've taken a couple of interventions. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Can you... Okay, thank you. But Derek Mackay, I mean, he doesn't easily take our word for it. I wondered if he paid attention to the recent Uniston and Jimmy Reid Foundation report on local government, because it states if local government continues to face the same level of grant reduction, there are extremely difficult choices ahead. Well, shake your head, but this is what it says. As it stands, the level and speed of cuts is not sustainable in the long term. Whilst the demand for services will continue to grow, the fall in budget is placing increasing pressure on local government and its staff. Those hit hardest by the cuts are the poorest groups in local communities who are and will continue to be unable to cope with service reduction or the complete withdrawal of services and the quote continues local authorities are facing the risk where they will be unable to meet their statutory duties and unable to deliver critical services to their poorest and most vulnerable citizens presiding officer we simply can't afford to go on like this so we can and must make different choices we have the powers to do so Yet despite all of the rhetoric, when the opportunity to actually use those powers is in front of them, this government is running scared. Declining to introduce a 50p rate for the highest earners, despite promising that election after election. Refusing to use the powers they argued for to top up benefits like child benefit, which would lift 30,000 children out of poverty. Our plans show that there are costed alternatives that can be made and which would make a real difference to working class families across the country. This budget does not raise enough revenue to stop austerity or fund our public services. That's why our plans to provide a near one billion stimulus package for the economy, by contrast, deliver the real change which is needed. The presiding officer, our plans would produce a budget which works in the interests of the many, not the privileged few. Thank you very much.
I call Adam Tompkins to close the Conservatives. Mr Tompkins, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Pay more, get less. That's the message of today's budget. This is a budget that puts up taxes despite the fact that the Scottish Government's block grant is going up this year. This is a budget that increases our rates of income tax despite the SNP promising more than 50 times in the last two years not to do that. This is a budget that will do nothing for consumers and that will damage Scottish business, damage that could take years to repair, according to the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. And perhaps most seriously of all, presiding officer, this is a budget that does nothing to address the fundamental problem with the Scottish economy, chronic low growth relative to the rest of the UK, the legacy of the SNP's decade-long mismanagement of the Scottish economy. Time after time this afternoon, we've heard SNP speeches that fail even to mention economic growth. And this, presiding officer, just shows how unfit to govern they have become. Growth isn't an economic buzzword, a piece of jargon we can choose to take or leave as we like. Growth is central. It, it goes to the core of how we fund our public services, those world-class public services that we all rightly demand. Grow the economy and you increase economic activity. Increase economic activity and you grow the tax revenues that accrue to the government. Boost tax revenues and there is more public money to invest in frontline services. It's not complicated, but it does seem to be beyond this, Cabinet Secretary. And this budget doesn't do any of this. This budget does the opposite. This budget takes money out of the hands and pockets of families, workers and consumers. This budget makes it more expensive to do business in Scotland by making Scotland the highest taxed part of the United Kingdom where everyone earning more than £26,000 a year will pay more tax. By doing this, the Cabinet Secretary is inhibiting growth, not enabling it. He's saying to hardworking families, don't strive for your family, put your feet up. Because if you aspire to succeed, he'll just tax your aspiration and then when he's done with that, he'll tax your success too. He's saying to Scottish business, don't invest here. Your confidence is low, he'll keep it low. Your taxes are too high, too bad. For here are the facts, presiding officer. Under the SNP, Scotland has the highest business rates in Europe. Under the SNP, business confidence is at a near record low, 20 points lower than in the UK. Under the SNP, Scotland's rate of business growth is slower than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. And business investment in Scotland is down. Pay more, get less. That's Nicola Sturgeon's dismal economic legacy. <laughs> Presiding officer, I want to say something about process and the budget process, which was mentioned, I think, importantly in a couple of the opening speeches earlier this afternoon, including by Patrick Harvey and by Murdo Fraser. There cannot be effective, there cannot be effective parliamentary scrutiny of the government's budget proposals unless those proposals are presented in as open and transparent a manner as possible. But yet again, presiding officer, this did not happen this year. Between the publication of the draft budget presented to parliament in December and stage one of the budget bill a fortnight ago, Derek Mackay found an additional 160 million pounds of public spending. This year's price for the Greens' support. This annual dance between Mr Mackay and Mr Harvey, in which the Cabinet Secretary routinely manages to find a nine-figure sum that he somehow failed to account for in his draft budget, is frankly one of the most unedifying spectacles in the parliamentary calendar. It is... John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Tompkins for giving way. I wonder if he would enlighten Parliament what is the difference between the process that Mr Mackay has gone through with the Greens in finding money to afford a final stage of a budget and the process I went through with the Conservatives to do exactly the same in the past. Mr Tompkins. The, the, the difference is that when the Conservatives were working with the SNP, we got results. When the Greens are working with the SNP, all we do is we push taxes up even higher and suppress the growth of the Scottish economy that we need. Presiding officer, the process that I've just described is not conducive to good government. No, no, settle down, settle down now. The process no, is not conducive. Mr. Tompkins. Sorry. 
I want to hear what everybody says. Mr Tompkins, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The process that I've just described is not conducive to good government. It is not in the public interest. It bypasses effective parliamentary scrutiny and it does nothing to diminish the SNP's growing reputation for preferring secrecy to open government. Murky backroom deals to transparent policy making. <laughs> Presiding Officer, this Parliament deserves better than that. And as we move next year to a new process of budget scrutiny, I hope that both government and parliament will learn the lessons of and not repeat the mistakes of the frankly B-grade and substandard process we've had to endure again this year. The third theme I think that has emerged from this afternoon's debate, uh, presiding officer, is that this is a budget of betrayal. This budget is a clear and unambiguous breach of trust. Yeah. Why? Because two-thirds of Scots voted in 2016 for parties that promised not to raise taxes in this parliamentary session. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, said it is not right to increase income tax for those who are on the basic rate. And again, Nicola Sturgeon said, I have been very clear that the government will not increase income tax. John Swinney said the same, as did Derek Mackay. Indeed, in the last two years, the SNP promised not to raise the basic rate 53 times, 53 broken promises. Today, the news is grim not only for those who were once fooled by the credibility of the SNP's false election promises. Today, the news is grim for Scottish workers. Today's figures show that employment is down in Scotland and that the employment rate is lower in Scotland than in the UK as a whole. Today, the news is grim also for the unemployed. Unemployment is up in Scotland and the unemployment rate is now higher than it is in the UK as a whole. This is the SNP's record and their budget today will do nothing to turn this lousy record around. Pay more, get less. That's the message from this budget and Parliament should vote it down. Thank you. I now call on Derek Mackay to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary. I thank you, Presiding Officer. This, of course, was a very significant debate, for, but for uh, politicians in the Chamber, I think the highlight must have been watching Mr Swinney burst Adam Tompkins' bubble in terms of uh, the, the summing up, uh, showing his uh, rhetoric to be empty and his numbers to be fiscal fantasy that's come from the Conservatives. But when asked, who would I choose? Who I, no, I'm not going to lower the level of debate to Neil Findlay, no thank you. Um, when I'm asked, sorry, too much to get through, too many important things to say, but when asked... The Cabinet, more, Secretary, my, Cabinet Secretary, can I just caution against personal remarks? Thank you. Who I... Then I'll talk about uh, political parties, uh, presiding officer, who I would rather align myself with. I have to say, when it comes to budget deals, yes, I do feel closer to the Scottish Green Party than I do the DUP. So I have no problem, <laughs> no problem in finding a consensus around progressive and positive uh, politics. Uh, the Labour Party may have considered them themselves a progressive party at one point, but now they are reduced simply to being an anti-SNP party uh, in this chamber. Can I return to some of the consensus that came through the programme for government. Areas such as abolishing social care charges for more people, expanding a free sanitary products, targeting resources to post-industrial Scotland, a graduate entrepreneurial challenge, investing in oil and gas decommissioning, electrifying road uh, transport, expanding our trade envoy network, supporting breastfeeding funding, more air quality and low emission zones, and in creation of a national investment bank. You see, the reason I've identified those PFG commitments is this budget funds those commitments and much more. Not, not widely debated this afternoon, but that's the kind of things that the opposition across the chamber has been asking this government to do. And that plus all the other investments are in our 1.2 additional resources in the Scottish uh, government's budget to be opposed by the Labour Party and the Conservative Party this evening. Happy to spend resources, but not a clue as to how to fairly and competently raise the necessary resources to make those investments. And in terms of the economic model, yes, I will. Patrick Harvey. 
grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Is it not a reasonable case that over the coming months and years, before we get to this process next year, we also strike a balance between how local councils not only spend but raise the money they need? Should we not be setting a clear expectation that councils have the ability to raise a significant proportion of the revenue that they will need for future years to provide their local services? Cabinet Secretary. So as I've said before, I'm always open to a discussion, but the reality is that this budget will give a real terms increase to the resources of local government before they even consider using their council tax power. But briefly on the economic model of the whole of the United Kingdom, it's clear, the evidence tells us that the UK government's economic a model is centred on London and the south-east of England. It is no surprise that other parts of the UK, including Scotland, are at a, a disadvantaged position because of that economic model. And the UK government cannot walk away from their responsibilities and macroeconomic policy. And the Tories also cannot abdicate their responsibilities in proper fiscal policy. You cannot raise less and spend more. Because you see, when challenged on making savings, uh, the Conservatives can only point to things like stopping the baby box as the answer to the question as to how they would find half a billion pounds to fund uh, tax cuts for the richest uh, businesses, people and homeowners in society. And it's no good of Murdo Fraser to say, if only he was in charge, I would then have a Scottish Fiscal Commission report that says I would have £16 billion more to invest in Scotland's economy. And when I found extra resources for the Scottish uh, uh, budget, it's no good for Murdo simply to cry wolf. I have set out a clear and transparent process, and if only the other opposition parties could engage constructively in that a process. Now, in terms of the a question around listening uh, to business, it, many business organisations have welcomed much uh, of uh, the budget. Uh, in terms of small business bonus, welcomed by the FSB, of course it is, but they said further the introduction of the new business accelerator relief is a clever move that deserves plaudits. Uh, SIPFA, of course, very, very considered opinion on public sector funding has said it's welcome news that Scottish public services will receive more funding as without extra resources uh, the financial resilience of many services would inevitably be put into question. Uh, Liz Cameron from the, the Chambers of Commerce has said we welcome much of the substance of Mr Mackay's announcements in terms of the budget. In particular we appreciate his willingness to listen to the voice of business. I could go on to the many quotes welcoming the investments that this government uh, will make uh, in terms of the positives in the budget. And even the SRC, much quoted by the Tory party, has said the decision on income tax to protect workers on low and modest earnings is exactly right. Or the SCDI who said this is a progressive, mature and significant use of Scotland's tax powers. So there's actually much support for this budget, including from the public who have backed our tax plans by two to one. But of course, James Kelly has presented uh, an alternative that frankly is not competent and is not coherent. The tax proposals themselves are cut in half in terms of behavioural uh, impacts. In terms of the other elements of the budget, it requires legislation. And when asked, of course, when the Labour Party would present their alternative budget. It now transpires in terms of the detail. It will come after stage three of the Scottish budget, a preposterous position from the Labour Party, showing that they have no credibility whatsoever. So in working with the Green Party, we've produced a budget that is able to find the consensus to invest in our public services and lift the public sector pay cap eh, in Scotland. And when James Kelly, of course, did the arithmetic on the tax plans in terms of income tax, he said an MSP's tax eh, would increase by only 26 pence. Now, James Kelly is wrong. I, I would advise members maybe not to seek their tax return advice from James Kelly because he's wrong to the tune of 1,300%. That's how inaccurate James Kelly was on the figures in relation to just an MSP's uh, income tax proposition. So why should we trust uh, the Labour Party on the overall budget? But in truth, what this budget does, and this is a very serious budget, uh, using Scotland's devolved powers responsibly in a fair way, 
It protects the students of Scotland from tuition fees. It expands childcare, which of course is good for children and good for the economy as well. It protects uh, universal support uh, around poverty and inequality, uh, delivering free school meals to P1 to P3 children. It ensures that the ill don't have to pay prescription charges and it supports the continuation of free eye exams. Uh, the NHS, of course, very precious service, is indeed the largest beneficiary of this budget. But it also protects those entitlements that give us the best deal anywhere uh, in the UK. It will help build 50,000 new affordable homes. It will help expand digital, investing over £600 million with new interventions on homelessness and child poverty. Real terms increases for the NHS, for higher education, further education, police and fire transformation as well. These are the kind of commitments that I know command the support of the Scottish people. And Bruce Crawford was right when he says that this budget puts the resources in place that speaks to the vision of what we want this country to be. It delivers on the commitments made by the First Minister in the programme for government. It prevents a uh, the negatives that have come from Westminster austerity, turning real terms reduction in resource into growth. It's creating a more equal society, tackling inequality and growing our economy. So as we approach the completion of stage three, of course, we've still got the non-domestic rates uh, element to go through, as well as the local government finance order. So it's not quite over yet. But as we complete, as we complete these legal stages of the Scottish budget, we have an opportunity, yes, to deliver that divergence, to make Scotland, for the majority, the lowest tax part of the UK, but crucially, the fairest tax part of the UK. Brexit is a huge challenge to the UK's economy and a huge challenge to Scotland's economy. Businesses said to me that was much greater concern than even the perceptions as propagated by the Tories around tax. So we deliver stimulus, sustainability and a stronger uh, society, respecting the powers, using them wisely with an evidence base to restructure tax to build a better and a fairer country. And I ask the Parliament to consider all of this and the £40 billion that's allocated in the spending plans in this budget. Now, I might not be a Morrissey fan, but the old band's back together. Better together are back together. Now, I'm more... I'm more... I'm more of a proclaimers kind of guy, and that's why I visited Leith yesterday. A GP surgery, there was indeed sunshine in Leith at the Leith GP surgery. And the NHS are the biggest beneficiaries of this budget. I would commend this budget to the people of Scotland because I know it commands the support of the Scottish people, and I hope it commands the support of this chamber this evening. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes our debate on the Budget Bill. The next item of business is consideration of four business motions. Motion 10579, a revised business programme for tomorrow. Motion 10562, setting out a business programme. And motions 10563 and 10564 on stage one and stage two timetables. I would ask any member who objects to uh, either of these motions to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motions on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Moved on block. Thank you very much. And no one's asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that we agree motions 10579 and 10562 to 10564. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motion 10565 on designation of a lead committee and motions 10566 and 10567 on approval of SSIs? Together. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. Um, the first question is that motion 10518 in the name of Derek Mackay on stage three of the Budget Scotland number two bill be agreed. And because this is a stage three, we will move straight to a division. So members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 10518 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 70, no 56. There were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Budget Scotland number two bill is passed. I propose to ask a single question on three Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does anyone object? Good. Uh, the question is that motions 10565 to 10567 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Neil Findlay on St John's Children's Ward. So we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.